Realm presents Outliers, a Realm original. Episode 7. I lay on my back on a padded examination table in a sterile room. The top half of the table tilted up like a hospital bed, so I was almost sitting. I couldn't move. My forearms and calves had been secured to the table with thick leather straps like the ones used on uncooperative patients in old mental hospitals. The plastic bag had been removed from my head, but I'd been gagged with a hard rubber ball in my open mouth. I couldn't yell. I couldn't plead. I couldn't explain myself. The girl wasn't in the room with me. I didn't know where she was. I looked around. White tile. Stainless steel cabinets. Spotless. They'd stripped off my clothes, all except my underwear, and dressed me in a hospital gown. Thumb-sized pads had been stuck to my chest to monitor my heart, I thought. Maybe my blood pressure or respiration. I wasn't sure. Lab technicians, all in white biohazard suits with oxygenated helmets, had been wordlessly coming and going. All wore heavy-duty navy blue night trial gloves. They drew tubes of blood from the veins in my inner elbows. They took samples of my hair, my fingernails. They swabbed my nasal passages and my inner cheeks. I could see their faces through their clear, hard plastic visors. They were human. No doubt about that. Men and women. A variety of skin tones, from light to dark. Where's girl? I wordlessly screamed behind my gag. Where is she? I was a task to them. A procedure to be performed. Data to be collected. Not one of them ever made eye contact. Not one said a single word to me. Not once. My head was immobilized by an affixed strap across my forehead with a rubber chin cup, probably designed for epileptic patients long ago. I could look around, not by moving my head, but by shifting my gaze. The facility had electricity. That much was clear. Machines hummed. A HVAC system kept the room at a steady temperature. I could feel the gentle air flowing from the vents. Cool, but not cold. After their samples had all been collected, the technicians stopped coming in and out. I'd been alone for a while, hours at least. I squirmed and bucked, but I couldn't free myself from the straps. I wondered if they were watching me through the plate glass mirror on the wall. Maybe not from behind the mirror, but I was certain they were watching me. Four cameras, one mounted in each corner of the room. Beady red electronic eyes glowing. Cyclops eyes focused unwaveringly on my table. I could speculate, but I couldn't reason out who they were, other than American, or what this place was. When the soldier dragged me through a gate and into the building, I could barely see anything through the plastic covering my face. Impressions. A tall fence, like one I'd seen in books about prisons, like the fence at our compound, only taller. A series of pedestrian gates shut tight and patrolled by armed sentries. A lot of soldiers, all wearing biohazard helmets. I felt a sob erupt in my chest. Girl, please don't hurt her. Finally, the automatic door slid open and a woman came in. Not donned in biohazard coveralls, but wearing a doctor's white coat over a knee-length skirt. Nylon stockings, low heel. No mask or nitrile gloves. I could see her naked face. Middle-aged, I guess. Slightly heavy, but the soft bulk suited her. Her smooth skin was the color of the semi-sweet baking chocolate had found in cans and ski resort pantries. Of African heritage, I thought. Her warm brown eyes met mine. The restraints are unfortunate, she said as she unhooked the gag from my mouth with her bare hands. Her fingers felt warm against the skin of my cheek, like girls, a soothing, educated voice. They're as much for your protection as ours. Instinct generated relief, and gratitude surged through my veins as I swallowed, trying to produce enough spit to coat my dry tongue. She wrapped my gag in a towel, wiping off the streaks of saliva like it was a hygienic act she'd performed many, many times. I recoiled a bit at that. I'm not sure why exactly, but the fine hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. I'm feral, after all. A woodland animal. Not raised by wolves exactly, but raised in isolation. By Da. Lack of a variety of human contact doesn't equal a reduction in human astuteness. Watch yourself, an inner voice said. Books and magazines are rife with expressions for the necessity for caution in uncertain circumstances. Hold your cards close to the vest. Be cool. Take it slow. Get the lay of the land before you show yourself. Don't drop your guard. Keep your options open. These people had taken me prisoner. They were holding me against my will. 
harvested biological samples without my consent. I had to be wary. I didn't know what they'd done with girl. Where's the girl I was with? I croaked. Here. Unharmed. We run a humane facility. Every new admittance is put in isolation until their status is determined. Then they are allowed to merge and coexist in habitation pods. To become part of a small, like status group. We define like status groups by approximate age and gender. It's more hygienic that way. She smiled. Her teeth were almost too white, too perfect. Da's teeth had been the color of unbleached bones. A bit uneven, a bit crooked. Maybe he was the exception and she was the rule. Status? I didn't understand. On the reversion scale, we believe most subhumans will never revert completely back to full human status. Even though physiologically the creature you arrived with has begun resembling a female human, like others of her kind, her language comprehension is virtually non-existent. Mutism is a side effect of their genetically damaged brains. Of course, we are optimistic that even a partial conversion will bring about a return of fundamental mental acuity. She called girl a creature, a subhuman. Pejoratives on par with mutant, synonyms, I should know. Like I said, I'd read the dictionary from cover to cover, aloud. And I know that when humans deem something not human, that means they are free to end its life at will, like cattle, or slaves, or outliers. Not good. Not good at all. Then the full impact of what the woman said hit me like a ton of bricks. Girl isn't mute. Her language comprehension is as good as mine, as is her reading ability. But she was letting these people think she was something she wasn't. A warning flare shot through the darkest part of my primal brain, like a comet across a moonless sky in the age of Neanderthals. Watch yourself, boy. No way to hide my accelerated heartbeat from those pads taped to my chest. My heart thudded like a trapped bird against my ribcage. The woman didn't have to look at the fluctuating numbers on the display panel to figure that out. She could probably see my heart shuddering under the thin fabric of my hospital gown. What is it? What's wrong? She genuinely wanted to know. Her eyes were alight with a scientist's curiosity, not with a fellow human's concern. I'd seen that look before on Da's face, when he regarded an outlier beyond the fence, before he shot it. Self-preservation is a powerful drive. So is love. I wanted to survive. If for no other reason than to be reunited with the one I loved, the girl. But rattling my cage would accomplish nothing. Shouting demands would only keep me in restraints. Animal cunning. Da always said, will keep you alive. I needed to be cunning and smart and patient. Physiological factors first. I forced myself to calm down. My heart rate slowly returned to normal. My eyes no longer bulged in their sockets. No more hyperventilating from panic. Breathe slowly and deeply. Think, boy. Think. Da and I had played chess for hours on winter nights. He always beat me, but from that game I learned strategy. Of thinking several moves ahead. Okay. The art of deflection, of changing the subject, relies on putting forth a plausible alternative for a set of circumstances. Under these circumstances, fear and bewilderment are to be expected. I need to keep the focus on myself. Don't let anyone see that girl is important to you. That way they can't use her well-being as a bargaining chip. What's going on? Who are you? I let my voice take on a plaintive, fearful tone of the boy I still resembled. A scared kid. Out of his depth. Not the man. The iron-willed focus strategist I'd been forced to become. She'd been watching my reaction closely. I think I fooled her into thinking I was scared for myself. She patted the back of my hand to offer reassurance. Relax, son. You're healthy. Fully human. You're not infected or contagious. Your biological samples show no sign of exposure or contamination. Then, beaming at me, white teeth radiant in the fluorescent light, you're the only full human to ever emerge from the contaminated zone. How about that, Michael? Michael, I thought. Who the hell is Michael? In this facility, where the power and communication grid is fully functional, as evidenced by the overhead lights and the medical machinery, computers aren't dead. Neither is the internet.
computers apparently had once again become overflowing fountains of information. No leafing through the pages of encyclopedias or phone books or pages of TypeScript for answers. Instantaneous query results came via keystroke, exactly like Da had described in the before. They'd run a sample of my DNA through some database. My deceased parents were in there. Aaron and Melinda Hale. The name on my Portland, Maine birth certificate came back as Michael Taylor Hale. The name meant nothing to me. I'd always supposed I had a birth name, but, like I said, I'd never gotten around to asking Da what it might be. Or his name, either. I didn't even know his name now. We were boy and Da. That had been enough. The civilized world was big on precise identification, it seemed. The woman in the white coat introduced herself as Dr. Roland. No first name offered. While I listened with feigned rapt attention, she rolled out her credentials. A clinical psychiatrist who specialized in neurobiology, with a specialization on the chemical makeup of the brain. A distinguished member of the board at the research facility here at what she called FOB, Far North. FOB, she explained, was military speak for Forward Operating Base, constructed on the border between civilization and the equivalent of Chernobyl's Zone of Alienation, or what they called the Contamination Zone. The research facility was government-funded, civilian-staffed, and under strict military supervision with a top-secret classification. I didn't ask any questions, though I was bursting with them. How far south had the contagion spread? Were they the only uninfected humans in the region? On the continent? In the world? Now I understood why patience is classified as a virtue. It's not easy. She had me escorted into an interview suite by a pair of faceless biosuited soldiers. They weren't gentle. They weren't polite. I suppose they didn't know yet what to make of me. I sat shackled by my waist to a metal chair bolted to the floor, but this time my hands were free. A single light overhead, casting the rest of the room in partial darkness. Like we were two actors on a spotlit stage. She sat across from me, legs crossed demurely at the knee, leaning slightly forward, attentive, hands folded in her lap. I remained bewildered boy, out of his depth but desperate to be liked. I was rewarded with a plate of cafeteria-made meatloaf, macaroni and cheese, and green beans, and an extra-large carbonated fountain drink. I ate ravenously, on purpose. Let her think that I could be won over with food and gestures of kindness, like a dog. I lived with dogs. I know how they behave. She waited until I had finished my meal, and was slurping up the remainder of my soda from the dregs of the crushed ice with my straw before she spoke. "'Will you tell me your story, Michael?' she asked, kindness and compassion brimming in her eyes thick in her pleasant voice. I don't think it was feigned, but she was a scientist with a job to do, and I was a subject at best, possibly a specimen. Okay, I said, making sure I sounded eager to please. Within minutes, I was strapped to a lie detector, though she didn't call it that. I'd seen enough pictures of lie detector machines in popular science and detective magazines to know what they looked like. The operator was an older man with a slight hunchback and bushy eyebrows, also in a white coat who never looked directly at me. I could smell menthol cough drops on his breath from six feet away. This machine monitors the functioning of your vital organs, she said, not telling me what its true purpose was. That told me something, and strengthened my resolve. The shackle at my waist stayed on. As much for your protection as ours, she repeated soothingly, like a line she used on a daily basis. She probably did. Two other research doctors slipped into the room to take seats along the wall. In the shadows, a man and a woman, Dr. R. Khan and Dr. D. Milbank, according to their keycard ID badges. They opened notebooks on their laps and clicked their pens, ready to take notes. Meanwhile, they studied me openly, like a zoo exhibit. To fool a lie detector, you had to be a stone-cold sociopath, which I wasn't, or fully believe the lies you were telling, which I didn't. The most successful lies as Da had inadvertently taught me by withholding the most shocking details of his life story for the entirety of my young life, are those of omission. When you omit something from a tale, the needle on the lie detector doesn't go crazy, since he didn't actually utter an untruth. Ergo, smooth sailing on the river of veracity. Omission was the way to go, but I needed to bury my omissions in a few important untruths in a huge pile of unfailingly accurate memories. I spilled my guts. I unloaded. Information dumped like a penitent tendering his last confession to a priest, like a lonely kid desperate to impress a new best friend, 
spewed out my observations drenched for authenticity with a hodgepodge of juvenile-like feelings, presented a dizzying amount of recollection. All that I remembered, every detail about my life from my very first hazy memory of the faces of my parents to my adventurous and largely fulfilling life with Da, I told it all. However, in this avalanche of truth, I was careful to omit a few things, particularly a relatively recent stretch of time, a specific sequence of events. I left out everything from the moment girl sent a rock singing at me in the woods, through Da's omission of who he'd been in the before and what he'd done, to my time with girl in the aftermath of Da's suicide. I didn't want them knowing about my relationship with girl. That was sacred. A secret. Telling them, I knew with absolute certainty, would endanger her. They assumed she spotted me on the road and followed me like a stray dog. Subhumans did that apparently, especially when they were in the midst of reversion. Let them think that. I spewed out a truth that matched their assumption. I described to Dr. Rowland how I looked back as I crossed a fallen log at a riverbank and saw the creature, standing in the tall grass at the opposite shore. How her presence startled me. But I didn't gauge her as threatening. That did happen exactly as I recounted. I just didn't mention that girl had been with me the entire time, and had crossed the river first. And I left out how my heart leaped into my throat when I glanced up to see her smiling at me while I tried to maintain my balance on the slippery log, my arms wheeling. She called me a clumsy big moose. I called her a sure-footed mountain goat. We'd both laughed as we walked off, hand in hand. But I omitted this joyful moment from my narrative. I didn't lie. Not exactly. And I didn't want to reveal what I'd lately learned from Da. For my whole life, I'd been oblivious to who he was, to what he'd done. I stuck with that. It felt like an ingrained truth to me anyway. Maybe it still would be, if I'd been in denial. But that's not who I am, who Da raised me to be. I omitted a few small things from my life story, too. I left out Da's recreational and random shooting of the outliers beyond the fence. Maybe because the memory filled me with shame. Probably because Dr. Rowland was laser-focused on any incidences concerning Da, and I didn't want to prolong the tale. I wasn't trying to protect Da's memory. I was trying to minimize my reminiscences of him so that I wasn't a key source of information of the man they seemed to be avid to learn about. I didn't tell them about my collection of books, or how much I'd read, or how smart I really was, or how much Da had taught me about survival and hunting and trapping and weaponry. Blissfully ignorant was wise posturing for someone unduly incarcerated and still getting the lay of the land. I left them with the impression that for Da I was like a pet, a useful idiot, an indentured servant plucked from obscurity to do chores. Not the beloved adopted son I had been, at least for a while. I didn't tell them that we called the naked humanoids outliers. I also altered a few salient facts. Not lied directly, but implied artfully. I intimated that Da and I lived the entirety of our lives at the abandoned ski resort. Because we'd stayed there for more than a week, I could provide a lot of detail. I didn't want them to know about our compound. About where it was. About how to get there. About where Da's ashes had been laid to rest. About my library and the armory and the Quonset huts. As fate accompli to my life story, I recounted Da's suicide by shotgun in graphic detail. But I didn't tell them why I believed he'd done it. Because of girl. I told Dr. Rowland truthfully that he'd been sick for quite a while. Sick was something that didn't respond to the antibiotics we'd stockpiled. I described how he'd grown steadily frailer. His personal hygiene had deteriorated. He stopped saying much. His eyes had grown cloudy. His speech slurred. All true. I let grief seep into my voice. Grief for the man I thought he'd been, not for the man I learned about recently. He'd been old even when I met him. I told Dr. Rowland with real tears in my eyes. It had been my belief that he didn't want to die in agony. True. That he wanted to die on his own terms. True. That he didn't want to be a burden to me. Possibly true. That his suicide had shocked me. It did. And his death was the reason I journeyed south. Basically true. The lie detector needle didn't spike. The operator sucked on cough drop after cough drop. Not riveted by the graph of my test. Good. I'm not sure why, but I also omitted the story of the ringing telephone. I didn't want them to think we ever had any indication that there might be other humans alive in the beyond. The few omissions that constituted falsehoods didn't register amidst the hours and hours of biographical detail I regurgitated. I was bewildered boy, 
now alone in the world, spilling his guts to a captive audience. I had to make them trust me, or I might never find a way to get the girl. When my voice grew hoarse, Dr. Roland raised a hand to indicate I should pause my narrative. I think that's enough for today, Michael. Or do you prefer that I call you boy? Whatever you want. Cooperative. Eager to please. Michael, then. She leaned forward. What she was about to say next must be important. Did Da ever tell you his real name? Real name? What he was called before. Before the change. I could answer truthfully. With absolute conviction. No, he didn't. I hoped that my answer would derail them from asking me directly if I knew who he was. And what he'd done. That Da had been the architect of the change. That Da had created the outliers. Apparently my avalanche of memories worked. She nodded and Dr. Archon slipped like a wraith out of the room and returned almost immediately with an electronic tablet. I'd seen plenty before, but this one was powered up. On it were two rows of photographs, like booking photos or driver's license pictures of men in their early to mid-sixties, all white men with closely trimmed beards, graying hair and blue eyes. Do you recognize any of these men, Michael? Take your time. I leaned forward to look closely. I pumped wonder and enthusiasm that I didn't feel into my voice. I pointed, index finger quivering. That's him. That's my doc. The three scientists exchanged looks. Deadpan. Expressionless. Whether revulsion or admiration lurked behind their professional masks, I couldn't tell. Dr. Roland gazed at me with genuine sorrow. At how naive I was? At how luckless I was to have been orphaned twice? Pitying me for having been the adopted son of a man akin to the notorious Nazi Adolf Eichmann? Or, in the alternative, grieving that she'd never had a chance to meet the great man, the architect of the New World Order in person? That he died before he got the chance to see what his creation had wrought? I don't know, but at least I'd passed their fucking lie detector test. Thank you, Michael. That will be all for today. Let me get an officer to show you to your quarters. You're listening to Outliers, narrated by Rory Culkin. Produced by Realm, your portal to another world. Listen away. Outliers is executive produced by Dave Beasley and narrated by Rory Culkin. Created by Cassandra Wells and Dave Beasley. Based on the novella Outliers by Cassandra Wells. Produced for Realm by Alexis Latshaw and Haley Wagreich. Additional sound design and editing by Rory O'Shea. Cover art by Kendall Thomas and Michał Krasnopolski. <laughs>